Virtual routing and forwarding instances might sound a bit intimidating at first, but the reality is that VRF is simply a VLAN for routers. We're going to take a physical router, a physical layer 3 device, and carve it up into multiple virtual layer 3 devices. Let's take a look. Once upon a time, we had physical layer 2 switches, and if we had multiple clients connected to this physical layer 2 switch, but we wanted to segment these into separate broadcast domains, well, the only thing we could do is deploy a second physical switch. And we could swing this client over to the second physical switch, but eventually that got a little cumbersome, and so somebody really smart decided to invent the concept of a VLAN. The VLAN, or the virtual LAN, effectively carves up our physical layer 2 switch into multiple virtual layer 2 switches. So this is one broadcast domain, and this is another broadcast domain. And we're going to use a very similar concept with a VRF. With a VRF, we're going to take a router, and we're going to carve it up into multiple virtual routing and forwarding instances, otherwise known as VRFs. Each one of these virtual routing instances has its own routing table. In other words, the routes that are installed into the one routing table are not going to be installed into the other routing table. We do not route between these VRFs while staying on the box. This is very similar again to our layer 2 world over here, the layer 2 VLAN concept. Even though we know with multi-layer switching we're able to route between VLANs by deploying SVIs, that's great, but we don't have a higher layer to go to from a routing perspective. Now we do have a concept called VRF route leaking where we can share routes between two VRFs, but in most of our designs we want to stick to how VRFs were intended to function. So if we want to route between these two instances, then we're truly going to have to connect a cable between the two, and then we'll be able to route across it. At this point we essentially have router 1A and router 1B, and so we can draw this out logically by showing an actual router, router 1A with a physical connection to a different router, in this case router 1B. Now, as mentioned, we have separate routing tables in each one of these routers. That's essentially the mark of a VRF. And in order to populate these routing tables, we need to install layer 3 interfaces into each VRF. Once we start configuring VRFs, we're going to find that each interface is part of the default VRF by default. So if I wanted to create a VRF called R1A and a separate VRF called R1B, well, at this point, I technically have three VRFs on my router. I have the default VRF. I have R1A and I have R1B. These are my three different VRFs. Once I've created these VRFs, I would start to assign interfaces into them. For example, I might take gig 0 slash 0 and assign it to R1A. Meanwhile, I might take gig 0 slash 1 and assign it to R1B. Every interface can only be assigned to one VRF. We cannot assign an interface into multiple VRFs. That does not work. That said, we can use subinterfaces to get around this from a physical perspective. So we could have a gig 0 slash 0 dot 1 as part of R1A, but then we could do a gig 0 slash 0 dot 2 and assign that to R1B. Every distinct layer 3 interface has to be assigned into one VRF. And yes, that does count subinterfaces and loopback interfaces and any kind of layer 3 interface. So how are VRFs used in network designs? Well, for one, from a service provider and a multi-tenancy perspective, this can be very useful because we can take one physical device, curve it up into multiple logical devices, and assign those logical devices to our different tenants. However, for those who don't work for service providers and multi-tenant infrastructures, well, we're still going to find that there are places where VRFs show up. One of the most common use cases is going to be the management VRF. A lot of Cisco devices by default these days will have a dedicated management port. The management port might be on one side of the switch, and then we have the front-facing interfaces that face out towards the network. And this management interface is going to connect to the management network, and it will be part of a separate VRF. By placing this interface into the management VRF, and placing the front-facing forts into the default VRF, well now there's absolutely no way to route between the management interface and the front-facing ports. The only way we could do that is by connecting the management interface to some kind of switched infrastructure, and then connecting the front-facing ports also into that switched infrastructure. At this point, we can communicate with one another because it's off the box. But without that in place, there's no way to communicate between these interfaces. From a design perspective, this can save us money in some situations. For example, I was working with an organization once that had two routers internal to their firewall. They had a Cisco ASA as their firewall. We had a LAN connection going between the routers and that ASA. And then the organization decided that they wanted multiple internet service providers upstream of the ASA. And in that situation, it's usually best to have a pair of routers facing the internet. Well, we had two perfectly good physical routers here, and rather than purchasing two new physical routers, we simply carved out new VRFs. We made this the internal VRF, and we created external VRFs. Those external VRFs were assigned interfaces that belonged only to the external side. At this point, we were able to connect those routers up to the ASA, we were able to connect them up to the service providers, 
And because the throughput requirements were nowhere near what these routers were capable of doing, we were able to save the purchase of additional hardware. So as we see here, we can give some out of the box thinking out of our designs by leveraging VRFs. We don't wanna to go too crazy. We shouldn't just use that as our default go-to methodology of deploying layer three nodes into our environment. But at the same time, in some situations, it could save us from having to purchase additional hardware. So as we look at VRFs, first of all, each VRF is its own virtual routing instance. Each VRF has its own routing table. And when we're configuring VRFs, we need to assign each layer three interface into its own VRF. So keeping in mind that every interface by default is part of the default VRF. Lastly, there are real world use cases. We think about service providers and we think about the management interfaces. We will see a lot of Cisco devices leveraging VRS just from a management perspective. And lastly, again, just outside the box thinking as far as how we do our network designs. I hope this has been informative for you. I'd like to thank you for viewing. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click here to subscribe to CBT Nuggets and click the notification bell to make sure that you're aware of every time we post new content. If you're interested in a career in IT or you want to brush up on your IT skills, then swing over to our website and while you're there, be sure to sign up for a free trial.